Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for that very warm round of applause for our musician tonight, Jamie Lemercier. One more round, please. I would like to warmly welcome all of you, particularly those who have traveled a long way to be here. And a very special welcome to Professor Jonathan Goodhand's friends, uh, families, and colleagues. Thank you also to those from other institutions who have joined us, because a SOAS inaugural is very special. It's a celebration and an enjoyable intellectual event for the whole SOAS community. This is the third of this year's inaugural lecture series. Professor David Hume will introduce Professor Goodhand tonight. David is Professor of Development Studies at the University of Manchester, where he is Executive Director of the Global Development Institute, formerly the Brooks World Poverty Institute and the Institute for Development Policy and Management. And he's also CEO of the Effective States and Inclusive Development Research Center. He's also president of the Development Studies Association of the United Kingdom and Ireland. David has worked on rural development, poverty and poverty reduction, microfinance, the role of NGOs in development, environmental management, social protection, and the political economy of global poverty for more than 30 years. He has worked extensively across Bangladesh, South Asia, East Africa, and the Pacific. His recent publications include books on global governance, poverty, and development. Professor Christopher Kramer will deliver the vote of thanks. Chris is Professor of the Political Economy of Development at SOAS in the Department of Development Studies. He's also a Vice Chair of the Royal African Society and a former Chair of the Centre of African Studies at the University of London. He leads on the Governance for Development in Africa programme, which SOAS runs with the support of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. He's also the Chair of the Scientific Committee of the African Programme on Rethinking Development Economics, which is based in South Africa. He is also involved with the International Advisory Group for a collaborative research programme in Colombia on land, inequality, war and peace, which is linked to the ongoing peace talks in Havana. And in 2000, he launched the MSc in Violence, Conflict and Development here at SOAS. We are very grateful to both of them for being part of this evening's event. Please join us for the drinks reception upstairs in the Brunei suite at the conclusion of the lecture. And two final housekeeping points. Please do note where the fire exits are in case the alarm sounds. Many of you, I hope, will tweet during the lecture. I encourage you to do so, but please make sure that you're phones are in silent mode. To introduce Professor Goodhand, I will now pass over to Professor Hume. Thank you. Good evening. Um, it's a uh great honour and a joy to be able to introduce Professor Jonathan Goodhand to you tonight. Um, it's an honour because Jonathan is a highly rated academic colleague whose work is of immense uh, value and it's also an honour because SOAS is such a strong contributor to our understanding uh, about development studies and about the ways in which the world is changing in Asia and Africa. It's a great joy because one of the compensations of being an aging academic is seeing your students do well. And Jonathan has done well and is doing uh, very well. He was a master's student at the University of Manchester some years ago and subsequently uh, a PhD student. I was trying to count, but my counting's not as good as it used to be, but it, it's not quite 25 years. But um, I think my hair may have been black at the time when we first met. 
Um, I'll go back a little bit into the history. As a master's student, Jonathan stood out, and he stood out um, in what was a vintage year. I've been looking back at the records, and back in 91, 92, we now have cheers from that group in Adelaide, Cairo, Dhaka, and Tokyo. We've got senior positions at the World Bank, the UN, and the DFID from that excellent cohort. But John stood out for two reasons. I mean, the first one was academic uh, ability. He got very high grades and showed great originality uh, and great critical thinking in his work. But the second one uh, was in his commitment. And Jonathan hadn't come to Manchester to look for good grades. He was looking for knowledge that would help him understand how the world worked and that he could then apply to make the world a better place. And those of you who know Jonathan will know that he's a, a very modest person, but his ambitions were extremely immodest. He was looking to get knowledge that would allow him to improve the lives of people living in some of the uh, most difficult uh, parts of the world to, uh, to improve lives in. Um, this desire to combine sort of deep analysis with practical action derived in part from his background. He had experience in East Africa as a volunteer, um, he'd worked in uh, Afghanistan and on the Pakistan border uh, in humanitarian work and also worked uh, in Sri Lanka. Um, I can remember back at the master's uh, level at him talking and wanting to find uh, frameworks that would help him understand whether taking um, sacks of used dollar notes on donkey caravans over the Pakistan-Afghan border for a major international NGO had actually made the world a better place or whether giving those sacks of dollars to the Muhajideen had actually created some of the problems which began to reveal themselves as the 1990s uh, unfolded. Um, John did very well in his master's degree and we uh, were keen to keep him uh, on at Manchester. At that time, we had a, a major focus looking at the emerging role of NGOs in development and our focus was mainly on NGOs in stable uh, environments and Jonathan uh, had worked in what we would nowadays call uh, fragile environments. We were also interested, and Jonathan was interested in these issues, at looking at the increasing uh, responsibilities and roles that were being allocated to NGOs. No longer were they simply to provide economic and social development, but they were supposed to promote good governance, to promote uh, democracy, to form civil societies, to strengthen social capital, uh, and a whole set of other uh, grand uh, goals. Uh, and Jonathan had interest in these. Interestingly, at that time, this was, uh, the, the, these zones were referred to as areas where there were complex political emergencies. I think still the hangover that somehow these were short-term emergencies that could somehow be overcome. The deep problems uh, that would not easily be overcome were not fully recognized then. So with a, a tiny bit of support from me, um, Jonathan actually did something very naughty. I'm sure his kids will be surprised at that. His children will be surprised at finding that. Um, we couldn't find a PhD uh, scholarship uh, that matched his interest, and so he designed a major research project for a, a leading aid agency uh, on that. But there was, in the small print in that, uh, a little stipulation that it was not to be used for PhD studies. And so I think when this proposal was being drafted, um, somehow the fact that this might contribute to a PhD was neglected in the application. But as a result, Jonathan took on a, a double workload and he more than delivered all the promises of the research project. He did the research, he created the data sets, he produced the articles and produced a book um, from it, but he also produced an excellent uh, PhD um, out of that. For me, it was fascinating as a, as a PhD supervisor and as a co-investigator to be able to work on NGOs with Jonathan, particularly to work in conflict zones. And the project that he uh, undertook looked at uh, Afghanistan, Liberia, and uh, Sri Lanka. And I think we're going to hear about Borderlands um, when Jonathan uh, provides his lecture in a few minutes. And it was Jonathan who actually introduced me to, uh, to Borderlands. He took me to uh, eastern uh, Sri Lanka and um, I found out probably most of what I know about borderlands there. Um, he had arranged for me to have a special visa as he had and we drove to a military checkpoint where we were checked over by armed guards and then we were waved through and moved into no man's land. And after a couple of kilometers, one could see trenches where there were uh, child soldiers of the Tamil Tiger uh, forces laying down with Kalashnikovs uh, and grenades in case the Sri Lankan army uh, decided to advance that day. 
A couple of kilometers further on, we stopped at a school and met the representatives um, of the LTTE and um, negotiated with them access for our research. And it was a, a rather surreal experience, uh, formally sort of talking with, uh, w w w with uh, two soldier bureaucrats uh, about what our research goals were and what methods we were proposing uh, to utilize. But luckily they uh, approved uh, the project and we were allowed to, uh, to move on there. It was during that study that uh, Jonathan certainly uh, showed to me some of the exceptional abilities and skills that he's got. He had to show real conceptual originality trying to compare the sort of rich empirical materials that came from those uh, three case studies, at times torturing himself to try and find a sort of conceptual framework that really would allow those materials uh, to be analysed. He showed sort of extraordinary uh, ability to conduct field work in the most difficult of environments. Real flair, uh, real energy in that. It took real persistence to work in areas that were effectively no-go areas. There were no other researchers thinking of working, certainly um, in these areas uh, at that time. He used a whole set of very original techniques. I remember in one village, uh, Jonathan trying to use co-production techniques to look at the way in which natural resource use had changed as the conflict um, had deepened. And in, um, uh, in Afghanistan, there were extraordinary efforts to train the husbands and brothers of women who were subsequently trained by those husbands and brothers and then chaperoned. But this was to ensure that in the work that we conducted in Afghanistan, despite many of the problems about gender, gender equality, uh, gross gender inequality in Afghanistan, this was to ensure that we could get access to uh, women's and girls' voices and understand what was happening um, in those uh, villages. Um, there was also an incredible commitment to taking back the practical findings and a whole series of, uh, of policy and practice uh, seminars organised in Peshawar, Colombo, Monrovia um, and London. And Jonathan also then showed his interest in capacity development. I thought it was foolish, but Jonathan managed to do it. But he took a, a Liberian and Afghan researchers with us to Sri Lanka. And I can remember, I think it was about 45 minutes of negotiation it took him, whilst he negotiated with the Sri Lankan authorities about why an Afghani and a Liberian were being brought in to discuss uh, the civil war uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, trying to explain why that, uh, why that was... Uh, appropriate, but uh, the visas came through. Um, fortunately for Jonathan, he's also uh, very tough. Any of you who have uh, jogged with him or run with him or cycled with him will know how, uh, how tough he is. He's a legend in my family. Um, he fell off a mountain bike when we were mountain biking and I patched him up with a small elastoplast and then we, we went home. But my um, seven-year-old daughter, um, after she'd sort of said hello to us, uh, did run into to my, uh, to, to, to my wife and said, Mummy, 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 why is that man bleeding on the floor? And Jonathan was, was too polite to point out that the small dressing that I'd put was uh, insufficient to stop the blood that was pumping out from this uh, mountain bike accident that he'd had. In Sri Lanka, he also uh, showed himself very tough. He could sleep anywhere, even when there were shelves uh, going overhead. He could eat uh, whatever was available. Um, and he um, was exposed to a whole set of problems there that he coped with. So these characteristics, this conceptual rigour, this uh, deep empirical curiosity, uh, boundless energy and commitment, and a desire to create knowledge and apply it uh, practically, I think they highlight certainly his early years, and they've continued from the work that he's produced at SOAS, on war economies, on looking at transitions from war to peace, and on the most recent work uh, looking uh, at borderlands. And I think we'll see those um, examined very carefully tonight. Jonathan has a very critical analysis, and he always challenges often the common sense interventions which external agents um, have looked for in these difficult borderlands. Uh, and I think we'll hear certainly about counter-narcotics and how what appears to be a sensible policy to stamp out uh, drug production can sometimes create incentives that will actually increase demand for drugs and uh, increase levels uh, of production. But Jonathan always goes beyond that, and he doesn't only look at those problems, but he also says, so what can we do differently? How can we, uh, how can we make these things less damaging and or help uh, improve these policies? I'll not delay things uh, any longer. But I think we've got a, a real tour de force tonight, so can you please welcome uh, Jonathan Goodhand, who will be talking about straddling the link, brokers, drugs and conflict, 
on the Afghan borderlands. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, David. I knew you'd get the, uh, the cycling accidents in there. So. <laughs> it just occurred to me, listening to, to David, uh, one of the things that uh, links David and Chris is we, um, we've, uh, we've all gone around cycling in Lycra together. So, that's, uh, um, so. so where do I find my... Okay, so good evening, everybody. Um, it's um, very nice to see you all. Um, it's very nice to see, to see family, my mother and father, and my Danny and Lara and uh, Tani, who have... I'm, I'm wondering whether they're going to be able to sit through 45 minutes, 40 minutes of me waffling along, but it's great to see them. It's really nice to see um, old friends from previous stages in my life, um, to see um, colleagues here, and also to see past students and current students. Um, so thank you very much for coming tonight. And I think the first thing to say is that um, Saras is a very unique place and uh, I'll be forever grateful for the fact that um, in 2001, somewhat to my surprise, I was offered a position at Saras after my, uh, my career, previous career as a teacher and aid worker and policy analyst. And I kind of fell into this. I knew very little about academia really at the time. I knew very little about Saras. But the longer I've been here, the more I've realized how lucky I was to land up here. And it's a place I can honestly say that um, I'm very proud to be part of. So in today's talk, I'm going to talk about borders, boundary crossing, and brokers. And in a sense, becoming a professor involves crossing a border and a boundary. So to pursue this analogy further, you have gatekeepers who say whether you're ready to cross the boundary yet or not. Um, and like many other real-life boundaries, crossing can be deeply theatrical. It can be very choreographed. Um, and you only have to look at other border crossings around the world. You look at the uh, Wagga, this example here. Or if you think about initiation ceremonies, which require brokers to help the uninitiated across these liminal zones. Borders are, are very theatrical places. And anyone who knows me, uh, with the Saracen inaugural lecture, is a border, kind of border crossing. Um, will know that this is not really my style. Uh, I'm not very happy in these things. Uh, I'm much happier in, uh, I may, may, may look just as stupid, I'm more happy in Lycra. And uh, I've in fact, was a professor appointed three years ago and I was avoiding it for as long as I possibly could. Um, however, I'm very grateful both to David and to Chris, who, if you like, are my borderland brokers who are helping me across this, through this, um, celebration, but difficult occasion at the same time. And also say, probably, I wouldn't be able to cross this border if it hadn't been for their inspiration, advice, and support over the years. Now, I'd like to say something about why I'm interested in borderlands and brokers, and David has given a few hints about that. Um, the formative experiences, for me, were, were my years as an aid worker, and that goes back to working in Afghanistan and Pakistan with the International Rescue Committee, working with Save the, Save the Children Fund in Central Asia, and working with INTRAC in Central Asia. And all these places were going through very intense processes of debordering board, de and rebordering at the times I was there, as a result of war making, as a result of decolonization, as a result of, of uh, state building. And to give you one vignette, and sorry, um, other students have heard me rabbiting away about this in the past, but for me, um, a, a very kind of important experience of stumbling on and stumbling across borders was going, as we called it, inside, into Afghanistan, as, as an aid worker. And this involved repeated visits going across and negotiating multiple borders, both the, the international border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, but also internal borders between tribal areas and, and, and settled areas, and then across a whole mosaic of complex boundaries between different Mujahideen commanders. The routes you took every time varied as the dynamics of the conflict changed, as attempts to regulate the borders changed, as territories expanded and contracted between competing commanders. And it changed according to the fixers who negotiated and mediated between these different boundaries, whether they were NGOs, whether they were commanders, whether they were tribal elders. Um, 
And going inside involved a whole rigmarole, a bit like today. You, you had to grow a beard, you wore a shower chemise, you wore a chitrali cap. My Afghan friend said I could be mistaken for a Neuristani, which was clear, clearly ridiculous, but it was all part of the drama of going across the border. Um, and though the border was not a comfortable place to be, it was frequently the centre of things. It was far from being marginal and disconnected. It was often in the waterlands where the action was taking place, whether it was sanctuaries and base areas emerging, or whether it was new political and social identities being forged, or alternative livelihoods being cobbled together, or new sources of economic wealth being generated. And so it was partly based on those kind of formative experiences that my research interest has emerged around borderlands. And I'm going to talk very briefly, I could talk about different projects, but I'm talking about one that is kind of very topical for me at the moment and is just starting, which is an ESRC project um, which has started this month, um, and which is the jumping off for today's talk. And it's called Borderlands, Brokers and Peacebuilding in Sri Lanka and Nepal, Water Peace Transitions Viewed from the Margins. Now, basically, the research is interested in how the relationship between the political centre and the state's margins is recalibrated in wartime and in post-war transitions. We intend to study different kinds of state margins, those that are politically and economically salient and those which are more marginal. Um, and we want to develop what we call spatial histories of these different frontier regions. Alongside that, we want to do and develop life histories of what we've called borderland brokers. So, for example, political or military elites, traders or businessmen and women, or religious figures who mediate between centre and periphery or across the borderline. How did they become brokers? Why did they become brokers? How have they adapted to and shaped changes in political relations, international, sorry, institutional arrangements, and conflict and peace building dynamics? Now, my starting point for this, the kind of the so what question, I guess, is the assumption that borderlands are not marginal, they're not disconnected, they're central often to the ways that wars are fought and the nature of the peace that follows. Some borderlands may be laboratories of and drivers of change <coughs> and development, of change in development and, and in political terms. And I'll expand on this in a minute, but the kind of the key point I, I, I'd like to get across here is they can be the equivalent of incubators or special economic zones for poor or fragile states. In other words, they may be a specific kind of space that facilitate or allow processes that can't take place elsewhere. And they have ramifications at the national and the regional level. So my, my, my assumption here is that studying the margins might tell us very important things also about the center. Or to put it another way, the character of the whole is shown sharply by attention to the edges. Thanks for that, Chris, by the way. <laughs> Peripheries are interesting places in their own right, but they're also privileged vantage points for understanding power relations at the centre and how these power relations are at least in part constituted by what's going on in, in the periphery. Now, the urgency of this task seems to be particularly ac acute as the borderland between the rich and the poor is brought ever closer to the putative centre, leading to the kinds of responses that we see in Calais or by Donald Trump to keep the periphery at bay. So now I want to expand a little bit before going into my case study um, on the Afghan-Tajik border um, around how we understand brokers and borderlands. <clears throat> So brokers are defined by their ability to straddle multiple life worlds, knowledge systems, and, and to act as gatekeepers. Brokerage depends on the existence of boundaries, of division, of difference. <clears throat> Some boundaries are more difficult cross to cross than others. They're more salient. More energy, more resources are invested in the defense and maintenance. So for example, international borders have this structuring effect on other political and social boundaries. The greater the power asymmetries, and the harder the border, the steeper the gradient between the two sides. This, in turn, creates incentives for transgression. So take an example, for instance, if you were to try and smuggle drugs across the um, Afghan-Tajik border, the, the security premium is much greater. It's a heavily militarized and policed border. The security premium is less, and the step in value is less in the Afghan-Tajik borderlands, as I'm going to talk about in a minute. It's still significant, but it's less because of the level of policing. 
Um, Eric Wolf, in a brilliant analysis of brokers in 1950s Mexico, kind of nicely captures the ambiguities and the ambivalence around this gatekeeper and go-between role. He argues that they're Janus headed, headed. They're always looking into different directions. They bridge the synapses between the center and the periphery. They address the problems, but they never fully resolve them. Otherwise, they would no longer have a function. So they constitute, at the same time, the connective tissue between the national and the local, as well as being point, the points of friction. And they are representatives of the state, but at the same time, they reveal the limitations of state power. So borderland, sorry, brokers, they take different historical forms, but they're a persistent feature of history and society. And I, one way of looking at this is through literature. So if you think about Thomas Cromwell's skill in manoeuvring in Wolf Hall, it's very like contemporary jockeying around the Afghan presidency that we see at the moment. If we take Baram, the Parsi opium trader in Amitav Ghosh's book, um, book River of Smoke, profiting from, by bridging the worlds of China and British India, we can see characters like this also by in, um, in the borderlands of East and Central Africa. They're not so different today. And if we take Kurtz's, how do, sorry, I can't pronounce it. Uh, Chris has been trying to tra train me on this, um, but I still can't pronounce it. Kurtz's, the narrator in Waiting for the Barbarians, is a seasoned inhabitant of a frontier zone between civilization and barbarians. He's unruffled, he's accommodating, and he's also horrified by the brash, border-hardening reflexes of the newly arrived Colonel Joel. This tension between these two lives can be found in accounts of UN officials in Iraq after 2003, or of British officials of the security development nexus in Afghanistan. So I've argued that brokers are persistent, they're perennial, but there is in a number of narratives around the emergence of modern states that brokers disappear, they wither away, they consign to a pre-modern past. So privateers, mercenaries, militias and pirates who have been foundational in the emergence of states were dispensed with as modern states centralised the means of violence and fiscal extraction. Mapping, census making, border delineation, these were associated with processes of enclosure with territorialization with the attempt to integrate and monetize people, lands, and resources of the periphery, so they become auditable commodities to the gross national product and to foreign exchange. So brokers are absorbed, they're co-opted, they're pacified, they're eliminated. Warlords become courtiers, who in turn morph into state administrators or bureaucrats. Now, you don't have to look very far to see that's nonsense, and I think a good place to start is Anton Bloch's superb study of um, the mafia of a Sicilian village. The key point that he gets across is that the mafiosi are intermediaries and they appeared in Sicily when the central state, after eliminating the traditional landowning elite, needed to find new interlocutors that could guarantee law and order in the periphery. The important point that Bloch shows is that state building and the mafia emerged together in a symbiotic relationship. And yet, if, to use James Scott's terminology, if we see like a state, then the role of brokerage and intermediaries are rendered invisible. Of course, there's a huge literature that critiques this kind of view, um, which encourages us to disaggregate and unpack this thing that we call the state. And I could spend a lot of time talking about political economy literature on uh, limited access orders, on political settlements, on the political marketplace, or I could talk about anthropological perspectives on this, about institutional hy hybridity, about bricolage, about twilight institutions, and. David Moss's work, and he's here today, on development brokers. There isn't time for that, but I want to make four quick points about why I think brokers are particularly important in relation to borderlands. So the first thing to say is that it's often at the edges of states where the complex political topography and institutional patchiness of the state comes out in sharpest relief. In studying the borderlands as extreme sites, they provide a lens for reading, if you like, the state as its limits. A multitude of state actors cluster around the border, the custom systems, the border police, the border guards, the military units, the health inspectors, and so on. A neoliberal restructuring of the states pluralizes these institutional arrangements even further. So I think borderlands are an interesting site to explore this constant tension that I've alluded to between, on the one hand, colonial and post-colonial 
um, forms of state building, including border delineation, including enclosure, the separation and purification of populations, and on the other hand, the constant challenge to these processes manifest in perpetual circulation, the mixing, the adaptation, the hybridity of social groups and networks and institutions. This can be understood as a tension between what Apajurai calls traits geographies, the attempt to affix specific attributes to a given space, and process geographies, where in which human organization is a result of various kinds of action, interaction, and motion, trade, travel, pilgrimage, warfare, colonization, exile, and the like. The second point I want to make is that borderlands are zones of economic opportunity and experimentation. Frontier regions and weakly regulated borderlands situated far from the gaze of the state have, if you like, a comparative advantage in illegality and illegibility. Such zones, like the Amazon Basin, the Eastern Congo, lend themselves to, if you like, adventure capitalism, the capturing of windfall profits based on high-risk, high-return activities, like illegal logging, coltan mining, drugs trafficking. And there is a certain functionality about maintaining this liminal state in the borderlands. So rather than seeing these as places, as James Scott does, of resistance, of constant conflict between the state and the non-state, Often they are places of collaboration, of collusion between state agents and borderland populations. National centers of power may be increasingly dependent on trans-border trading complexes. So frontier zones, we only have to look historically to see how frontier zones have had this important role in the dynamics of capitalist development. The opening up of the American frontier, the frontiers, the colonial frontiers of Africa and Asia. They were central to processes of capital accumulation in the imperial centers. There are also places of experimentation where alternative forms of governance, such as indirect rule, tribal policing, were trialed and then replicated elsewhere. And I'm going to argue that the violent kind of dynamics of primitive accumulation continue in many of today's frontier zones. Rather than withering away, frontiers wax and wane according to the shifting value of frontier resources and institutional arrangements at the border. The third point is that borderlands, these characteristics of borderlands, means they are really zones of brokerage. So rather than seeing them as autarkic, rather than seeing them as, as marginal, they're highly connected to global circuits of capital and exchange. And borderland communities of brokers are constantly learning to adapt to and manage and exploit this extreme extroversion. They act locally, but they think globally. They they are mediating between, the, in the absence of this mediating level of the state, brokers are literally jumping scales. So, for example, the catching entrepreneur doing deals with Chinese financiers to run casinos in Burma's northeastern borderlands. The borderland broker can never be entirely trusted by the state. Their political loyalties are never assured. Their networks may span over the border, and exit is always an option. So brokers are pulled in these different directions. There's a centri centripetal thrust of state building and the centrifugal force of markets. Borderlands of frontier zones can, in a way, be understood as ecologies of constraint and opportunity. Exchange, according to Karen Barkey, is a, becomes a sort of habitus, the habitus. Writing about the Ottoman Empire, she argues that the frontiers were a place where boundaries were acknowledged but constantly evaded. Now, my fourth and rather, um, very quick point is that though I've argued borderlands are important, policymakers tend to suffer from borderland blindness, that they tend to see like a state. Um, they tend to take um, the national order things for granted. They organize in national teams. Their key interlocutors are central state officials. They help construct national budgets. And yet, as we know, the kinds of issues and problems that David has alluded to in, in his um, talk. Conflict, poverty, environmental degradation, they don't respect borders. They're not confined to international borders. And I think this borderland blindness is, 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 a, is, a, is a, major, a major problem. Um, when borderlands are considered, they're considered either as unruly, ungoverned places that export public bads and they need, further, need to be um, securitized, to be managed, and there needs to be su surveillance, threats need to be kept out. I mean, and we don't, you know, we don't have to go very far to look at these kinds of policy narratives around borders. 
Um, an alternative way, I, oh, sorry, this is just um, what I think is a brilliant response to the Swiss, uh, the Swiss one. Um, we're not sheep. Um, um, the alternative representation, apart from being um, dangerous and governable places, is their lagging zones, that they have failed to integrate, that there's a lack of connectedness, and therefore there's a need to improve their connectivity to help them catch up so they can enjoy the fruits of globalization. Um, now, both narratives can be seen as spatial tropes, and they do political work. They tend to flatten complexity. They elide the underlying power relations. They justify particular sets of interventions or inaction. Um, and we can see these processes of hardening and integration not as opposites, but they're working in tandem with each other. They're illustrative of the complex and dynamic processes going on around borders, simultaneous efforts to harden or retool some, and soften and increase the permeability of others. And as I come to at the very end, I think a borderland perspective offers a very profound challenge, a very radical challenge to these kinds of policy narratives. I now want to spend the, the last half of my talk zooming in on the Afghan-Tajik borderlands. And uh, this is uh, based on uh, some research, ongoing research I've been doing. It's based on three research trips in 1998, um, when I was doing the PhD with David, on in 2006 and 2013. And it's right in the northeast on the border between Afghanistan and Tajikistan. If you can see that kind of funny kind of narrow neck of land at the very top of Afghanistan, the Wakhan Corridor, it's just to the left of there, we zoom in on that. Um, this, is, uh, this is the borderland. This is the border that I was looking at. And very kind of very quick bit of... Uh, um, an introduction to this. Um, the, this is a kind of, this is a, a high altitude um, area in the Pamir Mountains, um, a very kind of uh, marginal agro-pastoralist zone that it's, the border itself is divided by the Panj River. So this gives you an idea of the mountainous terrain. Um, the, the, more po the points of connection are the, are the valleys. Um, and this is zooming in on the border itself, which divides what is now Tajikistan and the, the, the province of gorno badakhshan Autonomous Oblast, which I'll call Gabal from now on, and Afghanistan's Badakhshan province. Korog, which you can just get a glimpse of on the left-hand side of the picture, is the, a, a city on the, or a town on the border um, of 40,000. And Faizabad is the provincial city of Afghan Badakhshan, which is con um, located in the centre of the province and has a population of 50,000. Now, the border regions are settled by Ismaili communities who straddle the border. Um, in Gabal, the Ismailis are the majority, whereas in Afghanistan, they are a minority in a province where Tajiks are the dominant group. One thing I, I, I want to kind of just a quick... Um, did, um, a quick kind of aside here. Um, I think something I, I really like to do, and it's one of the joys of working at SARS, is the PhD students um, who I'm very lucky to, uh, to have had the experience of working with. And I think I'd like to mention three in particular whose work has very much informed what I'm going to talk about now. Um, they are David Mansfield, who is a PhD who is on, on drugs in Afghanistan. He's the world expert on drugs in Afghanistan. His book is coming out soon with Hearst. Where, is there, he's over there, yeah. And uh, I highly recommend it. Um, also, Filippo Di Danielli, who worked with me and on one of these research trips, and his PhD was on, on drugs mafias in Tajikistan. And finally, Patrick Meehan, whose work on brokerage and drugs in uh, the borderlands of Myanmar has also been very important, has informed my, 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 my work here. So I'd like to thank them. I'll refer to, to, to some things as we go along. And also, David, his photographs are, um, were, were in the poster and also in this, the, the, this presentation. He's not only an expert on drugs, he's a brilliant photographer. So, let's zoom in. This area used to be on a kind of frontier shutter zone. It was situated on the northern routes of the Silk Route. And I'm going to tell this story in three and a half chapters. Um, it's not the complete story, it's just fragments of it. But just to give you a flavour of the borderland. So the first chapter, which I go through, skirt over very quickly, is the story of how this frontier shatter zone becomes a borderland. The delineation of the border in 1895 
as a result of the Pamir's Convention, um, which separated into um, the, this region into different per, um, um, imperial spaces between the Russian and the British empires. And the border wasn't actually closed finally until 1949, but this separation led to very different state building and development trajectories in the two zones, parts of the borderland, which, some of which will become apparent in a minute. The second chapter is what I call the Frontier Strikes Back. And this is related to, first of all, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. And this began the process of prizing open the border, the beginnings of the reconnections between the border people on both sides. The Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan, though, was the most significant thing. And then the subsequent collapse of the Soviet Union, that precipitated civil war in Afghanistan and Tajikistan. And that transformed the borderlands in a very profound way. Essentially, it opened up the border. It became an open frontier once more. It was transgressed. It was crossed by military groups, by the Mujahideen on both sides, by, um, and by a, a whole range of commodities, um, including drugs and, and weapons. In the 1980s, on both sides of the border, uh, political formations were sustained through external, tran um, external um, funding, through um, transfusions of financial and military aid. And the role of external assistance meant that rebel, go um, sorry, the end of rebel, um, the end of external assistance meant that rebel groups on both sides needed to find alternative sources of finance. Now in a remote resource poor, poor um, borderland, the drug economy became the, the main source of revenue for the political fronts. Drugs were not new to Badakhshan, there was a long history of cultivation, but from the 1980s, drug production rose steadily. And from the 1990s, it accelerated rapidly because of this structural shift in the conflict. The opening of the border and the growth of the drug economy made these Ismaili settled border areas extremely important. Gaining a foothold at the border was a key to generating rents and there was an influx of Afghan Tajik Mujahideen into the border areas. Ismailis in Af Afghanistan at the time talk about this violent period as the dark years and many of them migrated from um, to Pakistan in Chitral. All along the eastern border, control was parceled out to this mosaic of competing um, um, military entrepreneurs. And the importance of this border is magnified with the emergence of the Taliban, who gradually um, con ended up controlling um, close to 90% of, 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 of Afghan territory. So when I first visited the, um, Badakhshan in 1998, this was this kind of situation in Badakhshan. It's my first trip to the northeast. And it was this experience of field work, and I, I haven't told David this, and it's probably not the kind of thing to say at an inaugural lecture, but it was when I first got into drugs. So you, you, you go to Afghanistan, one thing leads to another, and it was looking at the, going to bad actions. Sorry, <laughs> um, going to this on this, I was going on this first research, first research trip. I was interested in how communities' lives and livelihoods have been transformed by war. But you only had to look around you and talk to people to see how poppy had become central to everyday survival and how bedded it was in the local economy. It really was the only game in town. Thanks, David, for this photograph. The liquidity of hawala dealers or money exchanges in Faisabad market was completely dependent on the drugs economy, shifting according to the annual cycles of poppy cultivation and harvesting. Poppy became a major agent of the commercialization of agriculture and the monetization of the economy, which in turn brought about transformations in social structure, including the emergence of new classes who accumulated and invested as a result of the drugs economy, the growing differentiation of the peasantry. As Mansfield notes, in a, in a poor conflict-affected borderland, for farmers, poppy cultivation is a low-risk crop in a high-risk environment. One of the reasons being that traders collect the opium resin from the farm gate and they take the risks of getting the product to the market, unlike for other cash crops. For traders, on the other hand, where the, profits are, the, where the main profits are made in this economy, illegality means there's a high markup and considerable price elasticity. It's easily concealed, easily transported, and has a long shelf life. As drugs move from farmers' fields to the border and then across the border, there's a significant markup each step of the way. By the time heroin reaches Moscow, 
which is one of the end markets, but also um, the, the UK, it's being sold at something in the order of $20,000 a, uh, a kilogram, compared to 4,000 in Tajikistan. According to UNODC, the, um, <clears throat> some 25% of Afghanistan's drugs are trafficked through this so-called northern route. And the routes from Barakshan uh, are numerous, and they also change quite a lot. The trafficking routes out of Barakshan have changed according to the security environment at each side of the border. During the height of the civil war in Tajik Tajikistan, when the violence was centered in the southern regions, the eastern routes, the two right-hand arrows, were the most important through um, Shignan and through Ishkashan. Um, and the, then the, the, the uh, it went up, we can't see that through there, but through um, to Tajikistan, into Osh, into Kyrgyzstan. Um, the dynamics of the drug trade reflected the political environment of the time. It was highly decentralized. There were many players and low barriers to entry. In many respects, it was a, a cottage industry. And up until the mid-1990s, most of the drugs crossed the border in the form of opium, in small shipments facilitated by boat, crossing the permeable border in what I've called a kind of capillary action. Coming back across the border were weapons, US dollars, four-wheel drives, crates of vodka, basic staples like rice and flour. From the mid-1990s, there were several important innovations and shifts in the drug economy in Afghanistan. Um, and we might see this as the embedding and the professionalization of drugs production. And this was partly because there was a strong military imperative to increase production at that time, given the Taliban's monopolization of other resource flows. But I think an interesting dimension of this is also how there was a migration of people, of capital, of know-how, and of market linkages from another borderland, in this case, Nangarhar in eastern Afghanistan, which had been a long-standing center of drugs production and drugs markets in Afghanistan. Um, it's a nice illustration in a way, because this area was controlled by the Taliban at the time. Um, so this would have been working against the military and political logic of the Taliban, but it shows how market, uh, market structures and political military structures don't neatly map onto each other. Now, evidence of these connections can be seen, for example, in the appearance of the Sagali red flower poppies from the east and the decline of the Hindi purple flower varieties that were traditionally grown in Barakshan. Mansfield also reports the growing use of technology and cultivation techniques imported from the east at this time. And finally, the number of heroin processing labs in Balakshan started to increase as drugs dealers moved up the value chain and started processing heroin, importing the necessary precursor chemicals via the east. And there's also um, reports that increasing morphine paste was sent up to Balakshan from Nangarhar for final processing and then export across the border. So going back to my analogy of borderlands as incubators. What we perhaps see here in this drugs intensified borderland was the borderland becoming a special economic zone. Political elites, market players drew upon the comparative advantages of this zone of illegality. Its market linkages, its tradition of poppy cultivation and these strong upward pressures to cultivate opium because of the lack of alternatives. And they also invested in the kind of the language of special economic zones in upgrading and capacity development so as to accelerate process of accumulation. Now, these trends and ex and were, were, were hugely magnified when there was the very famous Taliban um, and successfully enforced Taliban opium ban in 2000 and 2001. And this meant that Barakshan became the only poppy cultivating province in Afghanistan. There was a tenfold increase in, uh, the, in the farm gate price of poppy, which increased, increased the incentives even more to, to devote even more land to poppy. Um, and therefore, the total hectareage of poppy cultivation increased by 250% at that time. So, chapter three, which I've called The Return of the State. So, my, ne and my next trip to the borderland was in 2006. Um, and it was a very different situation. Well, the first time I went, I had to fly to, um, to Faisabad on the UN plane. 
This time I was able to drive to Shignan on the border from Kabul. It took two and a half days, driving northwards to the, through the thriving cities of Kunduz and Takar, and from there northeast up the steadily ascending unsealed road to Faizabad. And then from there, it was a bumpy half day up into the mountains, past the stunning Lake Shiwa, over the Shiwa Plateau, and then down the scattered settlements and orchards and fields to Shignan on the Panj River. Now, since my last trip to Badakhshan, um, peace settlements had been signed in both countries. On the Tajik side, the 1997 peace accord had been a pragmatic affair. The so-called wicked deal involved the divvying up of the control of the main drugs routes between regional power holders. The Palmyris contained control of the eastern Badakhshan route, though as the central government consolidated its power. Kuliob, in southern Tajikistan, whose political elite was part of the inner circle of power in Dushanbe, became the primary trafficking route. So going back to there, it's the, um, the, the left-hand arrows which became more significant in terms of the drug routes. To a large extent, and this draws on Filippo's work, um, drugs provided a source of rents that stabilised the state in Tajikistan. Revenues from the drug economy were used to cement political settlements between central and peripheral elites. This led to this growing integration and professionalisation of the drugs trade, with fewer players, higher barriers to entry, linked to the increased role of the state as the preeminent player. Now, on the other side of the border, the US-led coalition transformed the dynamics of brokerage and the political landscape of the North northeast. Large transfusions of CIA funding flowed into regional strongmen in these early months. A great deal of money was sloshing around the local economy in Badakhshan prior to the poppy planting season. And this was at the time, remember, when there'd been a tenfold increase in the farm gate prices of opium. So there are very strong incentives to invest in the drug economy, which I'll come back to in a second. US intervention um, and international state building that followed transformed the relationship between Kabul and the borderlands. For Badakhshan, this was experienced as a moment of rupture, with the collapse in the old front lines and the opening up of this remote borderland to the outside world. Road and communication linkages um, and, and ties with Kabul were developed. Road building within, Af uh, within Badakhshan um, happened. The removal of militiamanned roadblocks took place. The implementation, albeit patchily, of disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration programs, taken together, improved connectivity and security. A German led provincial reconstruction team was established in Faisabad. Faisabad. And the organization rolled out new programs, including the government's national solidarity program. People like um, Afghan Aid, um, who um, I, I, I've been a trustee of and done very good work in the Northeast, also expanded their programs at that time. The, the picture here refers to cross-border markets, which the Aga Khan invested in, uh, a major program in re-establishing connections between Ismailis on both sides of the border, through regional development, through building bridges, through cross-border markets. So to a great extent in the Northeast, there was a peace dividend in those initial years. In parallel with these de developments, for the first time really in, in history of the, certainly the remote borderlands, there was a visible presence of the state in these border areas. Um, the political transition has been characterized as a form of warlord democratization. So in a sense, Jihadi leaders and their militias were folded into the state administration at the provincial and the district levels. Um, Karzai's political style was to act as a broker, to govern through personal networks, placing loyal governors in the provinces and circumventing bureaucratic channels. Um, in Badakhshan, he simultaneously supported different individuals from two factions within the, the, the Mujahideen Party Jamiat. So therefore, on the one hand, the imprint of the state was consolidated, but on the other hand, on the other hand, the state deployed the same brokering techniques as the warlords, partly because it was made up of many of these same characters. Because the state could command resources, it became the main arena of accumulation outside the drug economy, and it was backed up with foreign military force as well as funding. And it couldn't be ignored by, by the actually elites, but the state was not powerful enough to subdue the old military class. The result was this oscillation of power, of hedging by peripheral elites. They were not par powerful enough to upset the new political dispensation, but they were strong enough to preserve their autonomy and to wait and see what happened. Now, in theory, 
one would have expected improved security in the ramping up of development efforts and the building of the state, albeit with these limitations mentioned, to have led to a decrease in poppy cultivation. Surely development plus state building equals less poppy. Yet poppy went through the roof, expanding year on year um, through, up until the mid-2000s. By 2004, it was ranked third in the so-called uh, Afghan Provincial Poppy Production League. Um, so what was happening? Well, firstly, like in Tajikistan, there had been a growing integration and professionalization of the drugs industry. And like, and like Tajikistan, the main player... So in, um, the main... And like, like, again, like in Tajikistan, the main player became the state. However, reflecting the more fragmented political landscape in Afghanistan, the more powerful position of regional strongmen and the country's long-standing status as a drugs producer, this has been a more contested and more uneven process. In some respects, drugs exerted this gravitational pull on the state from being this remote borderland that couldn't be profitably administered by the state, the border regions became a zone of opportunity that state agents sought to control. But the capacity of the state to assert control, control was limited. And therefore, coercive, rather than relying on coercive power, it had to negotiate, it had to broker its way into the borderlands. Indicators of the, kind of the growing... And, and counter-narcotics policies played into this um, process because they enable the powerful to take out more powerful, less powerful players who are involved in the drug economy. And therefore, the consolid one of the kind of indicators of this consolidation was the way that um, the, the, there was an upgrading from opium to herringer crossing the border, and rather than this capillary action, it was a funnel action of major shipments going across key exit points and across bridges. And only those with high-level um, patrons in government would be able to, to, um, to, to, to be involved, were involved in this. So there was this kind of performative aspect of counter-narcotics policies to do largely for external consumption around eradication and also this is a picture of warning people of the, the iniquities, the dangers of, of opium. Um, but... <coughs> In many ways, it had this perverse effect of, of consolidating and, 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 and building the linkages between major players involved in, in the drug economy. Um, and there's a complex gaming system going on in terms of the links between national level and local brokers. Um, on the one hand, local actors try and leverage external players in order to strengthen their hand locally. In the post-2001 era, um, Patrons, state patrons in Pfizer, or Kabul, or international players like the German PRT or the American Special Forces are being leveraged in order to get um, to um, extract resources locally. On the other hand, external players seek to gain influence by exploiting boundaries and divisions in the borderland space. Now, I was going to talk a little bit about one particular broker in the borderland, and there isn't time to do that in depth now, but it's about somebody who I've called disease and I, I've written about elsewhere. And he's an interesting case because he started off in the Nangarhar borderlands in eastern Afghanistan. He was a Pashtun and ended up as one of the major drug dealers on the Shignan border um, in, two, in the, in the mid-2000s. And he then married a, he, um, the daughter of his primary business partner, partner and moved across the border in order to move up the commodity chain he then got involved in kind of licit and semi-licit trade as well as drugs, including the ruby business. And his networks de developed further, connecting Pakistan, India, and Dubai. And then the last time I went back to the borderland, which I've come to in a minute, in 2013, he'd moved to a wealthy area in Kabul. So people who make money at the borders don't necessarily invest it in the borders. Um, but somebody like Aziz could not have become a successful broker in this area if he hadn't drawn upon his political, his social um, um, and his, his, eth his ethnic um, networks. And in a way, opium, op in, in many respects, was a lubricant that transgressed, that uh, overcame these points of friction between different kinds of boundaries. Finally, because I'm going over time now, um, 
The final chapter is, I call three and a half, because it's, it's playing out and we don't know how it's going to finish. But in our last trip there, Filippo and I went to, um, to Karog and, and Shignan. This time we felt it was too dangerous to drive there from Kabul, so we went to Dushanbe. And the story is really of unravelling political settlements on both sides of the border. On the Tajik side, we think this is due to actually the extension, the expansion of the state, the attempt of the state to renegotiate new political settlements in the borderlands to capture the resource flows around drugs. On the Afghan side, it's about the retreat of the state, about the growing presence of the Taliban, about um, the, 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 the international drawdown. And it's also about, which I haven't got time to talk about now, the, the, the perverse effects that elections have played into these processes of, of churning the political landscape constantly um, and, 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 and as a result unsettling the political order. Um, so it's unclear where this is heading at the moment. It's clear um, that um, political, um, there's a, a very strong connection between the political landscape and the drugs economy. And, this current situation now enables the Taliban to stand as the, pr the protector of the peasantry against state-run counter-narcotics efforts. Um, and the state appears to be in ret retreat in the, in, in, in the provinces, which means borderland brokers feel they have a lot more autonomy and a lot more negotiating power in relation to the state. I'm going to have to finish now, so I want to conclude just before four quick points. So the first one is, stepping away from the case study, I'd argue that we need to study borderlands. They're interesting, firstly, in their own right, but also because they have interesting things and important things to tell us about that can't be studied from the state centres. Not all borderlands are rebellious and unruly, and not all borderlands are economically or politically important. What can explain the differences between borderlands or within borderlands over time? I think there's scope for more empirically rich comparative work, which brings together different disciplinary angles and feeds into broader theorizations on borderlands, as well as policy debates. And I think SAS is in a very good position to lead such research. Given its regional expertise, the growing number of scholars who work on borderland issues, and some of them are here tonight. Paolo is here. Um, uh, I think James Caron's here and Patrick's here. We have a, a lot of very um, important borderland scholars who could lead such a project. And what I try to argue here is that studying the borderlands doesn't just tell us something about the border zones, the border zones themselves, it tells us something about the centre that cannot be studied from the centre itself. And this vantage point, as I'll come to in a minute, is profoundly unsettling. The second point is I think borderlands are laboratories of change, incubators of development. The liminality, the illegality, is functional. Historically, borderlands were zones of primitive accumulation and places of experimentation. I've argued that these historical processes resemble what is going on in many of today's borderlands. Illegible borderlands may be for the late developing states, the equivalent of special economic zones. They enable rapid processes of accumulation that can't take place elsewhere. So to pursue this analogy further, if as Ho Jun Chang argues, late developing countries have had the ladder kicked away from, away from them. Do borderland zones constitute for the political elites of some late developing states an alternative kind of ladder? They are places where state builders can pursue the unsavory strategies of their European predecessors that are disallowed at least, or at least moderated elsewhere by the mantras of good governance, human rights, and equitable development. Thirdly, Brokerage is key to understanding the character of borderlands. Brokers, I've argued, operate in this ecology of constraint and opportunity. They negotiate centripetal and centrifugal forces between states and markets, between different levels of power, between different authorities. And there's this constant oscillation back and forth which brokers attempt to keep in tension and to manage. These brokers, they come as the disease case shows with their own histories and life biographies. They draw upon different registers of power and sources of legitimacy. There are many other questions to ask. For instance, like Aziz, is brokerage a career or merely a, p a pathway? I think there's something very different from political brokers who 
who are, who are territorial, who stay in one area, from these kinds of market brokers? How does the role of brokers change from change in water peace transitions? And then finally, international policies have perverse effects on these dynamics that I've been talking about. External policies may be a vector of violence in borderlands. Militarised international peace building operations, the war on terror, the war on drugs, which have been associated with the securitization and militarization of borders, and efforts to pacify unruly borderlands through the deployment of drones, through counterinsurgency operations, through stabilization measures, inflame and catalyze cycles of violence in the borderlands. So a borderland perspective could have very radical implications for policy by exposing the linkages between insecurity and poverty in the borderland regions and the metropolitan centres. And it shows that many of the pathologies, the apparent pathologies of the margins, are generated by policy regimes and initiatives emanating from the putative centre. Well, what, a, what a, a nice thing to be able to do, um, to be able publicly to congratulate Jonathan on his professorship and to thank him for the, uh, the lecture he's just given us. I see it also as an opportunity of, to thank him for all his scholarly work, uh, for the inspiring teaching that I've watched him do here at SOAS, and indeed for his friendship though I'm still struggling with the idea of the three of us doing this in Lycra up here, I must say, but anyway. Um, Jonathan told us how he stumbled first, long ago, on the significance of borders and borderlands. And I think that's quite a, a nice vignette of, of how there's often a slightly arbitrary dimension to how we find and settle on the things that engage our interest as researchers for years, sometimes the product of what, what the science writer Stephen Johnson calls a slow hunch. And he may have stumbled on the subject, but he's not in any way stumbled to this latest border crossing, the passage to his professorship. Rather, he's been striding uh, directly to it, carving out a clear route through his research, the multiple projects that he always has on the go, his impressive rate of production of publications, his very, very thoughtful teaching and the intellectual leadership that he provides and obviously the, the respect he's clearly held in, not just here in SOAS and in academia more widely, but also amongst the NGO leaders, the aid agency officials, even military thinkers and, and officers with whom he has engaged. And of course this border, the one he's crossing now, some of whose checkpoints He's already breezed through, leaving just this final performative crossing tonight. It's very much a border that's at the heart, at the center of intellectual life. It's a boundary in itself that's no periphery, but the institutional core of a university and what this one, SOAS, stands for. And it's not a boundary where I want to detain him or you much longer. So with the prospect of more relaxed celebrations outside, I'll try to be brief. Late last week, uh, as I left my office, there was a student sitting, waiting in the corridor on the floor. And she craned her neck and looked at me. And she said, uh, oh, you, you're, you're giving an inaugural lecture next week, aren't you? And I, 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 I said, no, no, I'm not. Um, but, but my colleague, my friend Jonathan is, and you must come, so I hope she's here. Um, and I, but I, I left a bit, a bit puzzled. And then I thought, ah, two middle-aged men, glasses. They both work on violence and development. Vanishing hair underneath this that you can't see. Maybe she had us mixed up, I thought. And, um, but there the resemblance ends. And for one thing, to be a convincing lookalike, I'd have to be on stilts, as you can probably tell by now. I'd also need, and this goes back to what David said at the beginning, I'd need to be a lot fitter as well. One of the, the good things about knowing Jonathan here at SERS has been being dragooned by him along with our colleague Jens Lurkin, who can't be here, into mad cycling exploits. Um, the first time that, that we attempted the Etape du Tour, this is a, 
a, a day in the Alps when amateurs get the chance to do one of the routes of the Tour de France. Um, it, it ended with me failing to finish completely. Uh, Jens finishing but barely alive and in fact hospitalized. And, and uh, Jonathan, you know, he'd been across the finishing line hours earlier and couldn't see what the fuss was about, I think. And, Entirely, but and I've learned over the over over the years not to trust his idle promises on the weekends that he's he's really very very unfit and he he won't be able to keep pace with us and so on and so forth. Jonathan and David pointed this out. He's very very modest about his cycling exploits, his running, his triathlons, as he is too about his research and its quality and his engagement with very very senior policymakers internationally. But there's the same steel, the same commitment and hard work in his academic work. And sometimes working with Jonathan, for example, on the War to Peace Transitions course that we've been teaching together for several years, it's a bit similar to those bike rides. I'm, I'm pushing myself and thinking I'm doing quite well, keeping up with the literature, only to find that he's streets ahead and he's bringing new readings, new ideas and strains of the literature that might have a bearing on, on what we're working on, and I'm left sort of puffing and trying to stay in the slipstream of his, his thinking and reading and wondering how the hell he does it, frankly. Um, but so to Borders and Jonathan's lecture. Economists think of the marginalist revolution uh, as something that took place in the late 19th century with a shift towards the analysis of the implications of changes, tiny changes at the mar margins in, in, in market transactions. But in a way, I think perhaps there's a sort of different kind of marginal revolution underway in the social sciences at the moment. An increasing interest in the analytical fertility and the fundamental importance of the margins of nation states and domains of political order. In other words, in borders and borderlands. And this is not just about bringing the marginal into focus, about making the side effects the center stage. It's about, as we've heard, seeing how the peripheral, peripheral, the borderland, is actually at the very center of the processes of change, adaptation, and development. And I think it's obvious to you all from Jonathan's talk how significant his own contribution to this field is. As he put it, borderlands and the brokers facilitating and profiting from their crossings are not so much enclaves of troublemaking and backwardness, rather they're often incubators of governance and state-making experiment. In his rather superb analogy, they're a bit like special economic zones. Studying these borderlands helps us see how governance evolves, how states take shape in, in complex ways, often, perhaps typically, in ways that do not follow the neat, linear hopes and expectations of international organizations. We've seen some of the unintended consequences of international efforts to clarify and harden political ideological boundaries, as in Jonathan's example about the effects on opium accumulation and class formation of US aerial bombing. And my goodness, how timely that insight is. The attention, too, to drugs-enhanced borderland dynamics, where the boundaries between licit and illicit overlap with political geographical boundaries, has a wider comparative relevance. One example would be in the coca-producing and trafficking northern borderlands of Colombia, where there's still, I think, too, far too little attention paid, either by the direct participants in the Havana peace talks or by international organizations, to the significance of rather similar dynamics to what Jonathan outlined. Jonathan's work not only focuses on the creative tensions inherent in borderlands, it positively embodies those in his own intellectual approach. Many of us here are used to celebrating, by intent at least, the aims of being interdisciplinary. And few of us deploy interdisciplinary work quite so effectively and seamlessly and with such effect as Jonathan does. Well, um, in a world of razor wire, high wall, gated community disciplinary boundaries, that may be my paranoia of spending too much time with economists, but he, Jonathan, disregards those, and he upholds the right to roam. His values are those of Albert Hirschman, the values of disciplinary trespassing. And that takes a lot of verve and confidence to do. And in this, I think Jonathan gives us a superb example of the values that 
our department of development studies here at SOAS upholds in general. And while his range, the range of disciplines that he's keen to delve into, keen to draw on, keen to try to fuse together, his range is broad. I think there are two things that make, uh, that make this particularly effective in his work. One is that he's committed to field work, and often in very, very challenging environments. He doesn't quite let on because he is modest about that. He was one of the first people, in fact, to write, to publish on the ethical and the practical challenges of doing field work uh, in, on, and around contexts affected by violent conflict. But the other is that he, have, and he has, and you'll have to forgive my language here, there's no better way to put it, he has a powerful, innate bullshit detector. Uh, so, on the one hand, he's always alert to fresh ways of thinking, new ideas or prisms to explore, but he's also, on the other hand, always testing them against the pith of reality in Sri Lanka or Afghanistan and so on. Now, there's something else I, I have to mention. Um, for someone as interested in spatial analysis and awareness as Jonathan, he's made life pretty difficult for himself and us by splitting his time lately between London and, uh, and Melbourne in Australia. Um, but even that, he's managed to turn to a very, very interesting and selfless advantage, actually. Um, when people complain, as they do here, about the institutional barriers to collaborating across departments and disciplines at SOAS, and they do so with some reason, it's all the more important to acknowledge that actually this is what SOAS is really, really good at. Um, generating productive collaborations across disciplines and departments. We do it through our regional focused centers. We do it through the Food Studies Center or the Migration Studies Center and so on. And Jonathan has turned this difficult situation, having his life and his work stretched halfway around the world, to great advantage. He's managed through this to, to bring together lawyers, anthropologists, political economists, historians, political scientists, and geographers. We smuggled some back in after our geography department was transferred to King's. And others within SOAS, and then between SOAS and Melbourne, to develop this work, this evolving work on borders and borderlands, and their relationship to processes of state formation, socioeconomic development, and peace building. So we've got a lot to thank Jonathan for, and a lot to learn from him both in terms of the substance and the insights of his work, but also the way he's gone about it and goes about it. Now, I'm going to close in a moment, but I want to ask you, uh, when I do, if you could just stay in your seats for a moment and, and wait for us, the, the Lycra three or four, to, um, to proceed out, and then we'll welcome you upstairs uh, for, 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 for a drink. But I think you'll agree with me that we can now safely say that his papers are in order, and with that, we can slap down the final stamp on his intellectual passport and let him through. Jonathan, well done. Thanks.